You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's August 27th. Yesterday, two explosions near the airport in Kabul killed scores of Afghan civilians and at least 13 U.S. troops. The attack was carried out by a suicide bomber who targeted an area where crowds have been gathering as the U.S. continues to evacuate Americans and Afghans. The group ISIS-K, an affiliate of the Islamic State, has claimed responsibility. In an address yesterday, President Biden said the U.S. would retaliate and that he had ordered the military to develop plans to, quote, strike ISIS-K assets, leadership, and facilities. While details about these attacks are still emerging, RAND political scientist Andrew Radin offered an overview of what we know about ISIS-K. Radin formerly served as a country director for Afghanistan in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. First, it's important to note how ISIS-K differs from the Taliban, its enemy. The Taliban, at least in its current incarnation, has signaled some acceptance of religious minority groups in Afghanistan, Radin says. ISIS-K, on the other hand, has taken a much harder line and targeted some of its attacks against the Hazaras minority of central Afghanistan in particular. So why would ISIS-K carry out yesterday's attacks? One big motivating factor is that the group has a long-standing hatred of Westerners and of the U.S. and its presence in Afghanistan, Radin says. The airport in Kabul is a symbol of that. Raiden adds that the group could also have been trying to radicalize and recruit new members with such a high-profile attack. ISIS-K has a history of horrendous attacks on civilians, including an attack on a maternity ward in 2020 and an attack on a girls' school earlier this year. Finally, Regarding the question of whether this attack means that Afghanistan could now become a magnet for would-be terrorists, Raiden says that, from a geographic perspective, terror threats from Africa and the Middle East may be more concerning right now because ISIS-K and other terrorist groups in Afghanistan have been degraded. However, this is something that needs to be followed and researched more closely. Let's stay with Afghanistan, but zoom out to explore some of the wider strategic implications of the U.S. withdrawal. Prior to yesterday's attacks, Rand's Jeffrey Hornung wrote about the perceived implications of America's departure, particularly with regard to other U.S. allies. For example, what, if anything, does withdrawing from Afghanistan say about U.S. commitments to defend the likes of Japan, South Korea, or Taiwan? According to Hornung, strategic competitors like China stand to benefit from the narrative that America's credibility and reliability is now damaged as a result of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. But this argument doesn't hold up, he says. The reasons for leaving Afghanistan and the rationales for other U.S. commitments are vastly different. And further, the withdrawal isn't some kind of omen for the fate of any American allies. Quote, While it may be a cold reality that involvement in a burgeoning civil war in Afghanistan is not in the U.S. interest, it would be a mistake to conclude that the government is unwilling to deter Chinese behavior or incapable of stopping autocratic regimes from threatening an entire region. In fact, Hornung adds, leaving Afghanistan could even enable the U.S. to free up resources and focus more on countering Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific. The daily COVID-19 vaccination rate in the U.S. has increased in recent weeks, likely due to concerns about the Delta variant, which is ravaging unvaccinated populations and pushing hospital capacity to the brink. As Americans endure yet another wave of the pandemic, it's worth reflecting on just how effective the nation's early vaccination campaign was at slowing the spread of the virus and preventing death. A new study by researchers at Indiana University and RAND estimates that vaccination in the U.S. prevented nearly 140,000 deaths and 3 million cases of COVID-19 by the second week of May 2021. 
Again, COVID vaccines saved nearly 140,000 lives in the U.S. by the middle of May. The study also estimated the economic benefits. Saving so many lives produced an economic benefit of $625 billion to $1.4 trillion. For context, the U.S. government allocated significantly less for vaccine development and manufacturing through the end of last year, just $13 billion. These findings underscore the fact that further coordinated efforts to vaccinate Americans and people around the world will be critical to controlling the pandemic. At the end of June, the U.S. labor market had 10.1 million job openings, but 8.7 million workers were still unemployed in July. This may be explained by pandemic-related frictions in the labor market, says Rand's Catherine Edwards. Frictions are anything that prevents a buyer and seller from making an instant transaction. All markets have them, but COVID-19 has introduced frictions that we haven't seen before. For example, because of concerns about contracting COVID-19, job seekers may be looking for work that allows them to social distance, or they may want an employer that requires customers to wear masks. Edwards explains that childcare is still a barrier to employment for many people, too. Even though schools are reopening, kids under 12 aren't vaccinated and are still vulnerable to the virus. And in addition to the risk of serious illness, COVID-19 also introduces unpredictability for parents. For instance, if one student tests positive, then the whole class may have to stay home for five or even ten days. So an unemployed parent may need to find a job that not only matches their child care schedule, but also can accommodate potentially random and repeated school closures. In recent months, we have seen reports of wage increases for hourly retail workers and perks for new hires, including tuition or hiring bonuses. This is all good news for those looking for work and potentially for the labor market, but higher wages won't relieve concerns about the virus, says Edwards. And that means that all these pandemic-related frictions in the labor market could last until COVID-19 is fully contained. Virtual reality isn't just for video games. VR has broad applications in law enforcement, healthcare, counterterrorism, and beyond. If the U.S. establishes global leadership in the virtual reality field, then it could benefit in terms of both economics and public policy. On the other hand, if the U.S. does not foster growth in VR, it could mean losing an edge in international competition. That's according to Will Shoemate of the Party Rand Graduate School and Rand's Timothy Marler. While the U.S. does have an early lead in VR development and applications, China is making gains and regards VR as a central and significant technology. Not only has Chinese President Xi Jinping expressed significant appreciation for the value of VR, but his government has released policy guidelines specifically for the technology and has even created more than 3,000 VR arcades across the country. These arcades could help drive demand for more serious applications as users become acclimated to the technology. Shoemate and Marler say that all of this should raise eyebrows in the U.S. If China ends up dominating VR, it could also end up reaping all the benefits. We're going to close today's show with a quick recommendation. I'm sure that some of you already listen to Revisionist History, the popular podcast hosted by author Malcolm Gladwell. But you may not know that Gladwell serves on Rand's board of trustees. In fact, Gladwell's experience as a Rand trustee sparked an interest in wargaming, which is all about using games to test out different strategies and theories to understand and, most importantly, avoid conflict in the real world. Gladwell explored his newfound interest in a recent episode of Revisionist History titled A Serious Game. It focuses entirely on our wargaming research and features several current and former RAND experts. You can find this episode of Revisionist History wherever you listen to podcasts. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on what we covered this week, check the show notes at rand.org/podcast. 
We're off next week, but we'll be back in your feed after Labor Day.